So I'm going to get into this uh, into this uh, test system of ours, and I'm going to log in as a grantee. Now, there's several roles you may have as a grantee. You may have the grantee delegated administrator role, and that's the role that we give you first when your organization is set up. That person cannot access contracts or applications. Uh, they can access them, they can look at them, but they can't do any work in them. So you need to be in the role of a grantee or a grantee contract signatory. There's also the grantee system administrator that'll do it, uh, but you need to be in one of those roles. Um, with that said, I'm going to log in as a grantee and show you what I can do, and then I'll log in as a uh, contract signatory and show some other things that I can do. All right, so I'm going to log in here as jgrantee1. Okay, so I've logged in as Jeff the grantee, and you can see that I have a couple options here. I can go to, I'm at home right now on the top. You can see I can go to the portal, and if you've applied for anything before, you might have looked in the portal. That's the part of the website that's open to anybody. You don't have to log in, but you can browse and search for grant opportunities. You can sign up to be notified when opportunities are posted, or this is where you start to get your organization registered. So that was the grant opportunity portal. Uh, you notice up here also I have uh, applications, contracts, progress reports, and tasks. Those are ways of searching in the system, and we're going to be doing that in a few minutes, searching for applications or contracts. Uh, if you look at a couple other parts of the home page here, you can see this black bar here. I call it kind of reference. Um, you can see training materials. I can have some links to some videos or manuals. Organization is your organization that you work for, and depending on the role in the system, you'll have different things that you can do uh, with that organization button. Profile is your personal profile. If you need to change your password or anything about your, your login information, you can do that there. And then log out would obviously log you out. This blue bar here uh, is kind of an action button, and you'll see actions up here, such as save or add uh, or delete. Uh, when they're applicable to what you're working on. So we'll see an add button or a save button up here later. Since I am in the role of grantee, I could browse or search for grant opportunities to apply for a grant. You can see there's 136 of them out there now that apply to my type of organization uh, through all the different state agencies. But I'm not going to do that, and I'm also not going to click on my inbox. You can pretty much ignore the inbox. All this is is a copy of any uh, email that you would have received from the system. And emails don't allow you to actually do any work in the system, it just lets you know that there's a task. So I'm just going to ignore the inbox and you can do the same. What I do want to look at is my tasks. And you can see that in my case I have one new task. Now you may not have any tasks, and especially in a non-competitive situation, which a lot of these contracts are, you won't have a task, or the right person won't have a task. And that's okay because I'll show you how to search for it. Uh, in a few minutes. So if you do have a task, you would click on Open Tasks and see what they are. And in my case, it's an application or a contract, and we know it's a contract we're dealing with. And this is the name of my organization, Sample Organization, and this is the document that was assigned to me. This is a contract, uh, but it's sorted here in the application number, which we can click on and look at. We can see it's a contract in the status of contract info requested, and I received it today. So let's actually click on that, clicking on the number here. I know it says name, but it's the number of the application. And I'm in my contract. How do I know that? Well, it says contract main page here. You can see the application, which is just kind of the unique number in the system, is always up here on the top. And I could expand this details button just by clicking it. And I can see a little more information about it. Uh, again, my organization, the role that I'm logged in as, and that status that I showed you before in contract info requested. Uh, if I was able to share that PowerPoint, you'd be able to see that uh, there's certain different statuses you're going to work in, and there's really only two of them, contract info requested, or when it comes time to sign, we'll have grantee contract signature required. So we're going to deal with contract info requested, which means the contract has, parameters have been developed, and your program manager or contract manager has worked through the system and set up some parameters, and they've decided they needed to send it for you for your input. Either you need to fill out information in the budget or the work plan or something like that, um, or they just want you to review it. So contract info requested means you are allowed to make some changes and updates in your contract.
and you'll see what we need to do with that. So the work we're going to be doing will be under here in this forms menu. And if you've done an application before, that should look familiar to you. Uh, just to show you these other green buttons here, we have menu. That'll just bring us to that home page or the main page of the contract. Forms menu, like I said, we're going to be clicking on that and doing everything in there or searching through it. Status changes, you'll notice if I hover over it, I have one option here. We're going to do that when it's time for us to send it back to our program manager. And then management tools. Uh, you don't really have to use this, but there's one option here, add, edit people, that I am going to use later, and I'll show you how that will make it easier for other people to access this. And then progress reports and related documents, you can ignore that. Uh, it's not something we use right now. If it is, uh, they'll be training on it later, for, um, but it, I'm hearing now that you guys aren't going to be using it. So um, anyway, we're going to go into the forms menu and take a look at that. Before I do, back to this cover page, it just shows me one thing here, my period total. How much was I awarded for this contract or this period? So I can see that my contract is a multi-year because it goes from uh, 1 one 2018 to 12 31 2022 But right now, the current period we're talking about is this one-year period starting on 1 one through 12 31 18. So we can see that's period one right here. Next year, or 2019, when that's being developed, we'll see it as period two and 1 one 2019 through 12 31 2019 and so on for the next three years. Okay, so let's go into that forms menu that I talked about. You'll notice I can hover over it and see some of the options, or it's a lot better just to click on it and to scroll through. So if we look at this, we can notice a couple things here. It's separated in sections. We notice that there's some icons here, this kind of pencil and paper icon, the stop sign icon, which should alert you that there's something that you need to do. Um, so we're going to scroll through these different sections here. First of all is contract document properties. You can pretty much ignore that. Um, that is just an, basically an example of what documents will make up your contract. It doesn't matter for you to do that, though, because we're going to look at a contract preview later, and we'll look at it that way instead. But if you want to see the separate attachments or sections of your contract, there's the master grant contract here, which, has, uh, which is the state's kind of standard template for all contracts. And then under this view file here, I could see the specific attachment A1, program specific terms and conditions. If you've done an uh, application before, you would recognize that. That's in the applications as well. But again, you don't need to do that. You don't need to worry about that section. Same thing here in application information. Um, if this was an application it was filled out, I could click on this print application, and it would show all the details. Uh, but we have a better way of doing, dealing with that because we have a contract right now. If there was an RFP here and we applied for it, we could click on this link and go to the RFP, not applicable here. And application versions, if this was an application that we submitted, there would be a saved PDF uh, from the moment we submitted it, not applicable here if you're dealing with a non-competitive contract. Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to get to is program information. And we've got three sections here, or three items here, and two little errors because of the red hand. So the red hand should let you know this is something I need to deal with. So first of all, we'll click on contract information. And what this is, is there are three addresses that are fed to our system through SFS, the statewide financial system. The primary mailing address, the contract payment address, and the contract mailing address. The system and we don't really know which address is correct for your organization. Now, in reality, most of you are getting these contracts electronically, obviously, and getting payments electronically, so these kind of don't matter, but you still do need to save it and make sure it's correct. So if you had multiple addresses for your organization, in this dropdown, you'd be able to select the right one. In our case, you can see there's nothing special for me to select. They're all the same. So all we want you to do is hit Save on this. So just to reiterate, forms menu, contract information, verify the addresses, and hit save. Okay, that's simple enough. Next we have project site addresses. Now there may not be a red hand here, but I'm guessing when we try to submit this, it would give us an error. So you can ignore it until later, and, and when it gives you the error, reminding you to fix it or we can just look at it right now. 
So if I click on project site addresses, again, if you had done a application before, you would be familiar with this page, but this is uh, when the applicant signs, uh, starts their application and tells them, you know, where my organization is running this, uh, this program or project out of. So I'll just call this, um, you know, Jeff's headquarters or something. All right, and I'll put in my address, 123 Main Street, Albany, New York, and my zip code. So that's easy enough. But if you notice, there's two other options down here. There's regional council and agency specific region. Now, when there's an NA in here, it means that they were not, uh, it wasn't set up so that it was required of you to pick it. So I could ignore that right now. But if you notice in agency specific region, there is no NA. They really do want us to pick the right address or the right region, I should say. So if we were to submit this later on and we didn't select that, it's going to give us an error. Um, in fact, I'm not going to do that. I am going to wait and let it give us the error later. So let's pretend we didn't do this. I am going to hit save here anyway just to save my address. But let's save it and I'll get the error later. And you notice it's already given me the error. Agency specific region is required. Let's ignore that error and work on the remaining options. Okay, so the next stop sign here is program specific questions. Again, if you're familiar with an application, you would have had questions to answer throughout the system. This is really just, in this case, one question that was set up for you. But the reason in a non-competitive that this exists is this project title here. You'll see when I do my uh, contract preview that the name of my project, which shows on many pages, including the first page, comes from this field. So it's an important field, and we have to have some kind of question on this page. So we just say, are you currently pre-qualified in the Grants Gateway? So that's a whole other class and a whole other uh, section to worry about. In fact, we do have webinars on that every Tuesday and Thursday. We have a lot of support information about it, uh, about pre-qualification. But let's just say, yes, we verified that we are currently pre-qualified in the Gateway. And I'll hit Save, and that error you'll see has gone away. So we've taken care of that error, and we're going to ignore this project site addresses for a few minutes. And then we're going to get into our budget. And if you're familiar with the way these work here, um, the budgets are slightly different for these programs for the family support programs. Um, they have you attaching detailed budgets in, uh, in the upload section here. Um, and the, the details or the, the budgets that you're filling out are being filled out here in the other expenses. So if you've done a grant application before and you look at an expenditure budget, you might realize that there was a lot of other sections that are not included here. Um, because of the way we, we're working with these contracts, uh, other expenses are the ones that are only ones that are available here. Notice contractual narrative and tra travel narrative are there. Uh, it's just a, it's a defect in the system that even though we try to hide them, they don't hide, so you can ignore those. But what you care about is other expenses. And if, before I get there, if you might remember the number, the amount of my contract, let me go down here to, to, I'm sorry, expenditure summary to see what my contract is. So I was awarded for this period, remember the one year, $86,590. And my contract uh, budget total adds up to $86,590. So if they didn't match, there'd be an error here. And in fact, I'm going to make it not match just to show you. But that $86,590 comes from the other expenses and these two items listed. So we have FSS Program 1 looking at uh, attachment E for the net deficit budget and FSS Program 2. So Program 1 we had 48500 and if I click on this toggle down here, Program 2 had uh, 38090 So if I change this even by $1, I'm going to make this 38091. Notice I have the ability to make some changes. I could save or add or delete here. We don't really want you doing this, but I just want to point out where this comes from. So I made that change there just by one simple dollar. And if I go to the forms menu and down to my expenditure summary, I've now introduced an error there because it now adds up to 86591 when it should add up to 86590. 
So I just wanted to point out the relationship between that and the fact that you're not going to be allowed to sign this contract or even send it back to us until you fix that problem. So let's go fix that. I'll go back into my other expenses and I'll go to that program two that I just changed and get rid of that one and go back to 090. Okay, so if I go back to my forms menu and look at my budget section, that error is now gone. Um, there's two other things here that are just kind of optional. You don't need to work on them if you don't want to, but you can see I have a revenue worksheet and administrative worksheet. Um, basically, the program turned it on uh, just in case you need to fill it out. But what it is is for the revenue worksheet is just showing you the source of, or you're showing the agency your source from the revenue funds. And uh, you can see there's some required fields here with these red asterisks. You could fill those out to basically show where your revenue is coming from. Uh, similarly, the administrative worksheet allows you to call out where the administrative costs where administrative costs for the grant are going. So uh, these are grayed out here, but you'd be able to fill out uh, right here on the other section uh, what percentage or what amount is going towards admin of this grant. And usually it's less than 10% is allowed, so at the most it would be $8,659 here. Uh, but again, these are not required. These are sections that if for some reason are needed uh, for something that the um, the uh, regions are dealing with that we could fill those out. Okay, another thing that we have, so that's the budget section, expenditure budget. The other thing that we have here is our work plan. And if you're familiar with the work plans in contracts, they have a summary, which is really details of your project. And they have what's, what's called objectives, tasks, and performance measures. Essentially, these are the things that we are doing and we are being held to uh, to do in our contract. Now, when I say being held to, it's not like you're uh, we're withholding money if you don't achieve all your goals, or it's not like you're going to lose your contract if you don't achieve all the goals, but it's basically spelling out what are we doing with this funding that we receive from the state. So let's first click on grant, uh, work plan overview form here and take a look at what that is. Now, my program manager filled this out for us. That's why there's no error here. If if uh, it was left blank, we would have needed to do something here, and you know that because, again, of that red asterisk. So because of the way these are being worked, it says, please, please see attachment F for detailed work plan. I know for a few regions in the state, you'll actually have a work plan here. So it's up to some of the regions, it's up to the regions how they deal with it, but for most of them, they're referring to this attachment F that we'll look at uh, when we look at our contracts. Again, there's that period from 1-1 one, one to 12-31. And organizational capacity is not something we really need you to fill out. Uh, we know your capacity because we've been working with you probably for several years. Um, during the application phase, this is a required field that applicants need to fill out. Again, not real, really applicable here in our non-competitive situation. However, it needs something in this. So we could have just put the letter A or an X or NA or something. But in this case, they just copied and pasted that, please see attachment F. Okay? So that's the forms menu work plan overview. And then we go to our objectives, tasks, and performance measures. And you can see here, there's nothing there. I know that because there's no um, pencil icon. And I'm going to need to fill something out, though. So I need to have an objective, a task, at least one objective, at least one task, at least one performance measure. So think of it this way, you can have one or many objectives, each objective can have one or many tasks, and each task can have one or many performance measures. So I'm going to be very simplistic here, I'm not going to be kind of realistic, but I'll just call this um, Jeff's Objective 1. Now I don't have to give it a description, it's not going to show up on the contract, but if I wanted to, I could do that and hit save. And now that I've done that, remember I've been clicking on the forms menu all along. Instead of clicking it, I'm just going to hover on it and go down to tasks. And from here, I'll say it's Jeff's first task. 
And again, you can see task is not required. However, if I do type something here, it will show up on my contract. All right, so I'll just write here is the description for this task. So think of it as the objective as the high level goal, the task as a milestone, and now if I hover over forms menu and I go to performance measures, the thing that, uh, that proves that we did that milestone or that we accomplished that milestone. Maybe it's a date, maybe it's a number of beds or a number of widgets or whatever it happens to be. Um, in this case, I'm gonna be very generic. I'm gonna say Jeff's first performance measure. And you see you do require or it does require a uh, text here in the narrative. And you'll also notice I can attach something here and upload. The upload won't appear on my contract, but it's uh, something that could help maybe the program managers while they're working through this. So maybe it's a report that you have or something like that. All right, so again, these are things I'm telling uh, or I'm, I'm agreeing to in my contract that I'm going to be accomplishing. Now, sometimes because we're referring to that attachment F, I could just be saying refer to attachment F in some kind of inelegant way through these three lines. And um, we do that often when there's an attachment uh, for your performance measures. So I'll show you how that looks like when I look at the preview. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna go back to my forms menu and I've at least done the bare minimum there with my objectives, task, performance measures, one of each. Um, I should go back and just show you, I could have clicked the add button on any number of those pages and I could have added a new objective or two or three tasks for each objective or more performance measures for each task. So that's this add button right here. Okay, so now it gets into this, the pre-submission upload section. I'm gonna click on that. And you'll notice we have four sections here. We have workers' comp, we have a certificate of disability benefits, we have the A1, uh, the MWBE, and vendor responsibility questionnaire. So some of these, or one of these, the MWBE has a form here. Um, and this is one we're not using, is that correct? Yeah. So we're not using the form that they provided us because there's a newer updated one. And So your program manager will send you the A1. So let's pretend I received one and I'll actually just fill out this one here just so I have something. Um, but we want you to attach your worker's comp. Okay, that's easy enough. You'll have it. You'll go and find it on your computer. And in my case, I just have kind of a bogus sample document and I've attached it there. Now, I haven't really attached it until I hit save. Same thing for my disability insurance. I'll click on browse. I'll go find it and I'll save it in a minute. Uh, MWBE and then our vendor responsibility, I'll do that. So for the MWBE, I would have had a document template to fill out. Again, I don't want you clicking on these because they are, um, it's an older version and I'm gonna get an error here, that's okay. I'm just gonna fix this here. So let's say I did have the document to fill out I would go through and fill it out. It'll have, uh, it'll have unique information for your organization and I'll have the goals. So it could be filled out. I would save it. Obviously I click on enable editing here. I'd save it and same thing. I would click on browse and attach it. All right, so in my case, I've attached four documents. Now, I wanna make sure you realize something that uh, applies to the entire system, which is a timeout. So if I sat here and had uh, to go find those documents and maybe fill something out, and I never hit the save button, the system will time you out after 20 minutes of inactivity. And you may think, well, I was active, I was browsing and attaching files. Well, you didn't really do anything until you hit the save button. So the system doesn't kind of wake up or reset that clock until you hit the save button on a page. So don't get yourself into the, into the uh, problem of losing your work because you've waited or it's taken longer than 20 minutes and it's logged you out uh, and you've lost anything that you haven't saved yet. So uh, we certainly could have saved this with a incomplete page, that's fine. In fact, if I go here and I delete 
what I have for the MWBE. Now it's giving me an error that I need to fill out something for the MWBE, but that doesn't prevent me from actually saving anything else or even moving to another page. What it does prevent me though is from finally submitting it and signing this contract until I've, um, until I've taken care of all the red asterisks. All right, so in this case, I am gonna go back and find that document, or in my case, a fake document, and hit save. So we definitely suggest that you hit save every you know, five or 10 minutes. Um, you're gonna do it anyway when you go from page to page, but when you're on something like this that might take you a while, make sure you do it every five or 10 minutes. So that error has gone away, all the documents I included are here, and I can double check what I uploaded. So I can see now there's this view file link here. So maybe I just wanna double check and make sure it really was my workers comp that I attached here. If I click on view file, and I click on open, and of course this is just a sample PDF, but let's pretend that it was the real document, and yep, that's what I intended to attach. Or, no, I didn't, that's the wrong one, and I can click browse and go find it and uh, verify it again later after I save it. Okay, so that's the forms menu, pre-submission uploads. And there's one other folder here called the grantee document folder. And that's kind of a catch-all for any other documents you might need to upload. So what's gonna happen is, uh, it's gonna be blank before you start here, and it's a little finicky sometimes. Um, so I'll show you what I mean by that. And watch, it won't do it now. But let's say I have uh, an additional document to upload here. All right, I'm gonna give it a name, I'm gonna click on browse, go find something, and then here are my comments. And you can see the save button is enabled. Uh, sometimes it's a little finicky where the save button isn't enabled until you tab through those fields, but in my case it was fine. Um, so I just added a document. It doesn't become part of my contract, it's just something that maybe I need to provide to my program manager and they wanted me to save it so it kind of lives with my contract. And that's what I did. Now what if I wanted to add another one? That's fine, I can click on add and say here's another and go and browse and put in my comments and hit save. Now that I've done two, you can see those documents appear here in this drop down. I could go to the first one and maybe update it or um, you know look at it or whatever. Okay, so let's go back to the forms menu. Ignoring the one error that I've purposely left, we've gone through and we've done everything in here. We've gone through the contract information. We looked at and even updated our budget. We looked at and updated our work plan. And we added those four attachments that were required. And we even added some extra documents that weren't really required of us. So if you wanna look at what your contract looks like, you can do this contract preview here. Later on, we'll have contract versions and we'll be able to see the signed and unsigned versions of the contract, but they're not available yet because we haven't gone to a signature stage yet. Um, but we can do a contract preview. Now what's not gonna show here, uh, I'm pretty sure, is the attachment, uh, what were they, E and F? The attachment's E and F, because they haven't been added yet, because we just gave them to my program manager and they haven't looked at it yet. So if I do a contract preview, it's going to be lacking because it will not have that E and F. But I'm still gonna show you what it looks like. So when you click contract preview, it's building my contract PDF on the fly right now. So you do have to give it a minute or two to let it generate this PDF. So I'm looking at my contract. Uh, again, it's just a sample, it's not, the, it's not a signed one yet, um, but let's take a look at some of the options here or the way contracts look with the state if you haven't seen them before. Um, so this is a multi-year agreement. You can see uh, OPWDD, we can see my contract number. In my case, this is contract number 39. You can see that C00039GG. So I would refer to it as contract number 39. You can see the name of my organization. This is a new contract, of course. And there's that project name, Family Support Services. If you remember, back from my forms menu and back on the program specific questions, that's where that comes from. 
So we don't want you messing with that because that's what it needs to look like on the contract. So that's why it's been pre-filled for you by your program manager. Okay, you can see I have kind of a, fe a fake federal ID number and vendor ID number. Those, of course, would be real for you. Um, we have the addresses. So you remember those three addresses that I picked, and I clicked on save that they were all the same. And that's why this looks like this, with the check boxes for primary mailing and then payment address and contract mailing address are the same. If they were different, the checkbox would not be here, and I would have different addresses. So again, that's the, back to the forms menu, that's the contract information page that we did here in our forms menu. That's what fed our contract here in this bottom left of the first page. And I'm a not-for-profit. Um, this is actually a problem that hopefully my my program manager would find out or would look at, but I don't have my charity's registration number here, and that would be important if you were uh, an actual charity, and that needs to be on your contract. So I can show you where that comes from later on. Page two is going over the period and the terms. So again, there's that term of 1-1-2018 to 12-31-22. I know the period that we talked about was just that first year, 1-1-18 to 12-31-18, and I know it shows 12-31-22 here. It's just the way these show, and that's the way the State Comptroller's Office wanted it to be. But our breakdown, <coughs> excuse me, our breakdown of the different years is right here. And you can see in this case, uh, it increases year upon year. Okay, page three is where those attachments are. It's telling you, or it's telling the reader of this document what's included in this document. Our A1, the program specific terms and conditions. The B1 is our budget. The C is the work plan. The D is the payment and reporting schedule. And then we would have the E and F down here, which of course do not appear yet because our program manager hasn't gotten to that yet. Okay, fourth page is a signature page. No signatures here yet because we're still just looking at a preview. But when we do, we'll see signatures here on the different sections. Now, it's not like you're signing it in cursive or doing anything uh, with your finger or whatever. It's just the text from the system signing it. But what happens is, obviously behind the fact, is that this is a secure website and you logged in with your username and you're allowed to sign on behalf of your organization. And uh, obviously, electronic signatures are accepted by the state. So once it's done and it goes through the system, that's obviously a valid signature, even though you haven't physically signed it with a pen. Now I'm going to skip through the next few pages. Uh, these are 25 pages of the state terms and conditions. Every contract has these. They're exactly the same, 25 pages on every contract. And uh, obviously, you shouldn't skip it, though. You should be reading it and know what you're signing up for, basically. Uh, but I'm going to skip it, so I'm going to go on to page 30. All right, so you might remember we have the attachment A1. Uh, this is the program-specific terms and conditions, either related to the agency as a whole or the program. In this case, it refers to family support services. And <clears throat> don't know how many pages it is. It's several pages. We can scroll through here. Again, you will be reading this. So I'm not going to do that now in the, PowerPoint, in the uh, presentation here. Okay, so that brings us down to the attachment B1, which is the budget. So this is our budget that we looked at. Uh, it should look familiar. It starts out with the budget, uh, the expenditure summary, and there's that 86590, which is made up from the two, two sections of other. And if I scroll down, there's those two sections of other, our 48500 and our 38090. Then we go down and we actually see the summary of those, uh, I'm sorry, next page is the uh, work plan, attachment C. So remember that summary, it allows up to 50,000 characters. If you don't remember, let me click over there and show you what I'm talking about. Forms menu, down to the work plan overview form, and here's that summary. So in our case, it just says, please see attachment F, and uh, I've only used 47 out of the 50,000 characters available. 
But this is what it looks like on the contract, um, and it's referring us to that other attachment that we can't yet see. Okay, then it brings us down to that work plan detail. And you remember I did one objective with one task and one performance measure. So obviously if I had more of those, uh, it would flow underneath the different objectives or tasks, and we could have, again, many, of, uh, many objectives, many tasks, many performance measures. But remember in our case, we're referring to our attachment F. So those don't appear until after attachment D. This is the payment and reporting schedule. So the way that these contracts work is if there's numbers and details filled out, it's applicable to you. If you encounter a uh, table that's blank, it's not applicable to you. So for instance, uh, in my case, I do get an advance payment of 25%. So it's going to be a uh, requested advance. I need to request it when it comes time to get paid for it. Um, but the, the contract does spell out that I'm allowed a 25% advance. So there's no scheduled advance down here. That's what this would show. And this talks about recoupment of the advance. It's just how uh, we'll essentially pay back that advance. <clears throat> You'll pay back in what you're claiming will not be paid fully uh, until the, the advance is covered. So then it talks about the claims that we can put in. So we're going to obviously claim and, and claim for payments, uh, for, put in some invoices and claims. And in this case, it's saying you are doing them quarterly, and the claims are due 30 days after the end of each quarter. Now, of course, you're not in trouble if you, your claim is late, um, but this is just the way it's spelled out and really the way the contract uh, wants you to do it. We have no schedule of claims, so that would be here if there was one. And then what reports are due? So there are three different things that are checked for us that we need to fill out on a regular basis. The narrative qualitative report. You can see we need to submit that no later than 30 days after the end of each quarter. Your program manager will give you details about that. Your expenditure report, same deal, on a quarter based, quarterly basis, no later than 30 days after the end of each quarter. And then the consolidated fiscal report. This is a report that uh, you'll submit on an annual basis here. And uh, this is saying it's due on May 1st of each year. Uh, and then upstate Long Island is November 1st. This is actually new to me. It's rare that anybody picks this. So um, if you guys don't know about it, I'll ask the uh, regional uh, people to talk about it later at the end of this. It is? Okay. I'm being told it's in attachment D, so we'll be able to look at it. Um, I'm just going to do a little mute. I hear some background noise. There we go. Okay, so yes, it does, um, as we go down here, we'll see that. On the next page here are the progress reports. Uh, final progress report is not filled out, so it's not something that's applicable to us. And if we go down here, we don't have any additional reports due, so there would be a table of dates and when they're due, um, but we don't have one here. And if there are any special payment and reporting provisions, we would have them here, something that we'd have to adhere to. Maybe it would explain a new report that we have to do or uh, something special about payments. Uh, <clears throat> so this attachment here does go through the advance and the reports that we talked about before. So I'm not sure if this is going to be different for each one of you. Obviously it will if in this case it's showing your exact amounts. So this is what uh, my organization will be dealing with when it comes to Advances, payments, and reports. Okay, so we're, we're done here on attachment D. Now again, what we're missing is the attachment E and F, which will happen once our program manager gets a hold of it. So delete and up, upload a document. If you notice in the grantee document folder, I don't think you actually can. Oh, no, you can. So um, what you're doing here is you delete the entire document that I gave. So remember, I uploaded two documents here, and I did this one, and then here's another. Let's say additional document, or let's say here's another I want to get rid of. If I hit go, and I realize, oh, this is completely wrong. I can hit the delete button up here in the blue bar, hit OK, and it's gone. And I don't have, I only have that one. Now, where did that one go? Well, let me go back to forms menu, back to my grantee document folder, and there's that one document I added. 
So that was the delete button up here. Whenever you see the delete button in this blue bar, it means delete everything on this entire page. So you wouldn't want to do that if you went to, for instance, the program-specific page, program-specific questions page. If you did that, it would say, are you sure? We're going to delete everything on this whole page, which, of course, you wouldn't want to do. If you go to the pre-submission uploads, there's really no deleting. I mean, you can see you can delete if you want, but it's just as easy to save over because you need something in all of these fields anyway because of the red asterisk. But if I did want to delete, I would click on delete here, hit save, and it'll blank out what I, whatever I save for the disability, but it's going, to re, it's going to remind me, hey, you need something here because of the red asterisk. So you could save over or delete, but eventually you still have to save here. So I'm going to try to submit it, but we know we're going to have an issue because I forgot to do one section on purpose. But let's do that. That's here under status changes, and I can send it back to my program manager by going to contract information submitted. So I'll click that button, I'll do apply status, and it says, wait a minute, you didn't do the, you didn't select the region on this page. So if you had multiple errors, it would give us a link to multiple pages. In my case, it was the one that I missed. So I can directly click on if I want and go here and say, oh yeah, I did need to pick my region and let's say I'm in Capital District and I'll hit save. All right, so I feel like I'm done. I've done everything I needed to for my program manager. And I'm going to status change and apply the status of submitted. And I didn't get any errors back, so how do I know that I've moved that? Well, a couple things. Number one, remember I had a task. If I was to go back to my home page, which I will in a minute, I won't have a task. But I can also see under details that it's now in a different status, program manager review. And... Um, I can also notice if I go to my forms menu and go to one of those pages that I've changed already, for instance, I worked on uh, the work plan overview form, I can still type whatever I want in these fields, but it doesn't matter because I don't have a save button. So you're, you're no longer allowed to save or make any changes on these pages. So I wanted to show you one other thing here uh, about finding your contracts. And I might not be the person that needs to work on it because in, in my case I'm not because I'm the grantee. Eventually my grantee contract signatory needs to sign up, needs to sign off on this contract. Now he or she could go in and search for it under applications or contracts, which I'll show you in a minute. Or I can make it slightly easier for them by going here to management tools and add edit people and I can pick that person's name. So if I know this guy, Jeff Signatory, is the one that I want to sign it, I can, hit, I can check his name and hit save, and the next time it comes to us, he'll get a task and an email. So again, what I did here was in the contract, management tools, add edit people, and I picked Jeff's name. Now maybe these people, I don't want them to get it. I can uncheck them and hit save, and that'll accomplish the same thing. So in the future, when it comes in to get signed, he'll get an email and a task. All right, now if you don't have the email or task, here's another way of finding your contract. I'm gonna go to home here, just to show you, remember I did have a task before, it's now gone, because this is in the hands of my program manager. But how do I find that contract if I wanna find it again? Well, I log in, I go to applications or contracts or tasks, could allow me to search for it. So I'll go to contracts, and for this one, I know it's got the word family in it. I could do that and hit search. And I can see I've got two, actually. I'm going to work on another one later. But the one we were just looking at, remember, was application, or I'm sorry, contract number 39. So I could click on that and get into it. There's that 86590 we had. I could go to applications. I could search for it that way, again, different criteria. And if it was a task for one of us, maybe someone's on maternity leave or sick and I want to see what tasks they have, I could go here and go to, where are we? Um, applications and contracts, I could search using their last name or some of this other information here, the word family or something like that. 
Back to contracts, I could also just leave it clear. I could hit clear and hit search, and this will give us all the contracts that my organization has. And if you don't have that many in the gateway, it's not going to be a big list. We have a bunch of dummy contracts here, so I do have a good number here, eight of them. But again, it's pretty easy to find out which ones. It's these on the bottom here, 39 and 40 are the ones that we care about right now. So several ways of finding a contract, even if it wasn't assigned to you. All right, so I'm going to log out here. And I'm going to log in as that program manager. Obviously, you would not be doing this, but I just want to move it on to the next status, which is getting it signed. So I'm going to go in here. He has a task. He's going to look at, and in fact, he's going to make the attachments. So I'm going to, that was number 39. I don't have it here. That's okay. He's the manager. He's going to search for it. Oh, right, right. Yep. It's got to be this one. And we can see that he received it. Uh, on today's date, and we can see that he's got something to do with it. He'll do what he needs to do, and he'll move it up to contract manager. And the contract manager will make some changes or look at it, not necessarily make changes, but the contract manager is that person that attaches those attachments E and F. So I'm not going to do that now. Uh, just imagine the PDF will have two other attachments at the end. Uh, but what I am going to do is now send it to get signed. And this is the second thing that your organization would need to do. So this program, this contract manager, I'm going to log in as him. And he's got a task. I'm guessing it's that one. There it is. He clicks on it. He does some uh, editing. He adds those attachments, E and F. And then he's going to send it to you for review. I'm sorry, for signature. So he's going to send it to the status of grantee contract signature required. All right, so what's happening here is he's creating, or the system is creating, a, uh, a saved version of your contract with no signatures yet, of course, but with those attachments E and F that you provided him, or that were provided. Okay, so um, I'm going to log in as your, or as my, signatory. Actually, I'm going to log in as a grantee first, just to show you. I'm the grantee. I log in. I've got a task. It's that one we just worked on. I click on it. It's in signature required, but I can't sign it. That would be done under status changes, but if you look, I don't have any options there. Why? Because of my role. I'm the grantee. So even though you received it as a task, that doesn't mean you can do everything that's allowed here. So I'm um, sure I can look at it, but I can't go in. Everything's locked out, just like we saw before. I can't go in and make any changes, and I certainly can't sign it. So if you're unfamiliar with the roles, uh, it's important that we do this because you might have a separation of who does what at your organization. <clears throat> so instead, I'm going to log in as that signatory someone who's, a lot, who's allowed to sign a contract. Spell it. <clears throat> so I log in as Jeff Signatory, and I notice he's got a few tasks, or one task. And he only gets that task because, remember, I added it with that add, edit people. If I didn't, he would have to go to contracts and search for it. It's just a couple extra clicks. So in this case, I am going to click on it. And we see it's in that status of grantee contract signature required. By the way, I also just received an email saying you have a new task. Uh, please log into the gateway and view your task. It doesn't say exactly which one, but of course I went to my tasks and I saw there was only one. So if I go to my forms menu, I would not sign a contract unless I looked at it one more time. So I would go down here and remember before we clicked on contract preview. Well, now there's actually a version. If I click on contract versions, I can see 
the unsigned version. And as we go through the system, there'll be the signed version by me, then there'll be the agency signatory and the attorney general and OSC and so on. Um, so eventually, once I have an executed contract, I'll be able to go here and see my fully signed executed contract. Uh, if they didn't approve it for some reason, there would be a, uh, a reason that your um, the OPWDD would work with, but in this case, obviously, uh, we're not going to get that far anyway. All right, so I do want to sign it. Uh, let's say I looked at this, everything looks good, I want to sign it. I'll look at it later once I put a signature in. So remember that under status changes and now as a signatory, I do have options. I could go here to signature complete, which is signing it. I could try to get the contract manager to review a new period. That won't work. It would give me an error. That's not applicable right now. Modification, that's also not applicable because I don't have an executed contract yet. In the future, you may be using modifications, but that certainly doesn't happen right now. But I could, let's say I looked at my preview and I realized something was wrong or uh, something needed to be updated. Instead of signing it, hopefully I would have talked to my program manager and said, hey, I found a flaw here. But then I would send it back to contract manager review. They could fix it and then send it back to me. But in my case, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hover over status changes and apply the status of signature complete. Okay, so I read this agreement essentially saying I am who I say I am. I'm allowed to sign on behalf of my organization. Uh, it talks about MWBE here and the master grant contract. And I'll click on I agree. Now you could click I do not agree. It'll just bring you back to the forms menu, let you do it another time. But in my case, I'm going to agree. And it's now signing the contract on my behalf. So what did we just do? Well, if we look at details, it's now in a different status. It's in contract package validation, which is what the uh, contract manager deals with and then moves it on to the agency signature and the attorney general and so on. Um, eventually, it'll move through those statuses and become an executed contract. So let's talk, talk about a couple other things we can look at. First of all, let's go back to the forms menu, <clears throat> and I'm going to look at that contract version, and there will now be a new one. So instead of that unsigned version that I didn't look at, let's look at the signed version. And I click on it, it's got this PDF, it wants me to open, and I can either save it or open it. And I've got 47 pages here. Looks like exactly what we saw before, except for I've now signed it by Jeff Signatory in the title of Signatory on today's date. So again, nothing fancy or cursive, uh, but it is uh, a real signature. And then eventually the agency will sign it, Attorney General will sign it, and OSC will sign it, and we would see those versions here on contract versions. So the only other thing about this is my ENF would be attached here. <clears throat> because if this is a demo and I haven't gone through it all, uh, the real steps, obviously we didn't do it, but if it was done, I'd see them down here on page, let's say, 48 and 49 or the next few pages. Okay, so I've done everything I need to do. It's going to go through the signature process, but I might be wondering what's the status. And if you want, you can, you know, call or email your program manager, or you could log in and go to, maybe you'd have to search for your contract. Let's do that because I, uh, I don't have it as a task anymore. So remember, I had a view task here before I don't. So let's go, you know, let's say a couple weeks have gone by, and I want to see what the status of my contract is. I can go to contracts. I can search for, let's say, the word family again, or just search on blank. And we can look and see, there's that contract number 39 here, and I'll click on that. And uh, one thing you can look at, or one additional thing, is this period schedule report. That's found here on your main page of your contract. So if I click on it, it's another PDF, and it'll give you some insight into where your contract has been and what it needs to do before it's executed. So it's separated into two sections here, contract development and then contract approval. So we're all done with contract development. We did uh, the program manager review was scheduled for five days. We obviously did it in a matter of uh, minutes today. Uh, contract requested, that was me, that's what I did. And it was scheduled for 30 days, but of course I took zero. Uh, and then it went to contract manager review, internal review, and then uh, I signed it. 
So I was given 10 days to sign it, it took zero, and I've got 10 remaining days. So it's just showing you what we planned, how many days we planned for this to happen. Now obviously your contracts are uh, start date of January 1st, so you've got plenty of time to do this. But when you add this together, it's 227 days. So it's not exactly plenty of time if everybody was to take the full amount of time listed in here. So basically this is a guide to say, you know, if we can get it within these number of days, um, we'll be able to get a signed contract on time prior to January 1st. But if someone takes longer, nobody's in trouble if they take longer. Let's say it took you uh, 15 days to get it signed when we had scheduled 10. That's fine. It's probably made up somewhere along the line. But we just want to make sure that we try to get things done prior to that January 1st date. And obviously, uh, not just the day before. Um, so that's kind of what we're striving for here. That's the idea behind this report. And the next page, it's just showing you the status as it's gone through. So we can see when it went to that status and when it moved to the next status with a date and time stamp here. So if I wanted to know where my, stat where my contract is right now, I could have just looked on that page in the gateway or I can run this report and see where it is right now and how long it's been there. So what happened after your grant was awarded? Uh, the program manager, the contract manager developed the contract parameters. That was the things like the uh, number of days for um, uh, when reports are due and uh, the advance information and so on. They were looking at it, updating it, reviewing it. They did program, uh, they did contract review previews, and then they sent it to you for, uh, they sent it to you to update, and then eventually they'll send it to you to sign, and then it gets signed by all the different state entities and becomes executed. So remember those two tasks that we dealt with? The first one was contract info requested. We needed to go through our forms menu and work on some of the details. We needed to provide the address and we needed to provide the attachments and look at the work plan and so on. And then of course we needed to sign it at the end to make sure everything is locked in at that point and we put in our signature by doing it electronically. Okay, this is just to show you the stages that you can kind of go back and forth. I only did it once, but after I filled out my information, maybe my project manager still found some flaws in it, and they could have, so let's say I sent it to them here, they could have sent it right back to me for me to keep working on it, and you could kind of be in this loop forever until they move it on to contract manager review and then to get it signed. So just this is letting you know that you can kind of go back and forth between the different stages until everybody's happy with what the contract looks like. All right, so this is important here. I wanted everybody to, to see this, uh, the grantee user roles. And if you're familiar with our uh, grantee user guide, that's the manual, this is in section 4.1 of that manual. It's around page 18 of the manual. <clears throat> but anyway, these roles you should be aware of. The grantee delegated administrator, that's the person that originally got accounts when we set up your organization. So that could have been back in 2013 or any time in the last four, three or four years. That person, like we saw, can work on the document vault, pre-qualification, and they could add or edit user accounts, which I will show you in a few minutes, um, but they can't work on a contract. So they can only view the contracts. Who can view the contracts? Well, the grantee can. They can edit the contract information, which we did. They could submit that information, which we did. And they would receive emails from the system when there's a task. But again, I couldn't sign. Only these two people on the right can sign. The grantee contract signatory, that's who I was. I could have done all the things that the grantee did, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, but also sign the contract, which is what I did. There's also this user, the grantee system administrator, and he or she can do exactly the same things that the grantee contract signatory can do. So we're fine with either one of these, um, but I just used grantee contract signatory when I did it. Okay, I remember I said, how do you add users to your account? If you're the grantee delegated admin, it's simply organizations, organization members, which is this right here, add members, and then new member. And you're filling out the person's name and uh, importantly, their role here. In this case, I'm adding somebody in the role of grantee contract signatory. 
Okay, we talked about ways to locate tasks. You could look at my tasks, which both my grantee and signatory had. I could search the task list, which is what I, I looked at, but we didn't really search for anything. But we did search here under contracts. I could have searched for applications. And if I go to this next page here, this should look familiar. This is what we did when we searched for a contract. So we filled out some information. For instance, I put in the word family right here, and then I hit search and was able to search for that contract. Okay, and we looked at that period schedule report. We looked at the fact that there was some contract development steps that we went through in the first part here, and then we went through the approval steps in the second part. Uh, and we looked at the number of days that it actually took and the days that are remaining. And finally, I just wanted to tell you what these statuses mean, the ones that you might have looked at in the uh, current status or in that report I just showed you. So program manager review, you saw that. Program manager can review or edit your contract details. Contract information requested, that's where you uh, have to work on it. Somebody at your organization has to work on it to fill out some of the required information. Contract manager review, it's locked for your editing, but the contract manager can review it and or make some changes. Then they move it to internal review. That could be like legal or fiscal review at the state agency. And then it comes back to you, your organization, to get it signed. Grantee contract signature required. Contract manager routing, you might notice that. That's kind of your contract manager finalizing things and uh, getting ready to move it to the AG. Uh, Attorney general, they can sign it. Uh, OSC, they can sign it. They sign it electronically. Um, at some point, maybe the AG could reject it for some reason. You might see that status. That doesn't mean your contract's dead or canceled, but sometimes they have to uh, request a little more information. Um, and then this STS determination is when we electronically submit the, uh, the uh, contract to OSC. So you might notice these statuses, and uh, I just wanted to point them out.